Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this update about the latest COVID-19 surge and its impacts on Oklahoma City hospitals. I'm Jennifer Schultz, Senior Vice President of Marketing and External Relations at OU Health. Today, we come to you not as OU Health or Mercy or Integris or SSM Health St. Anthony. We are here as one voice because the rise in COVID-19 hospitalizations over the past few weeks has pushed our hospitals to capacity, creating an urgent need for hospital beds. Because of the increased demand and because our hospitals are facing a shortage of nurses, we simply cannot continue at this pace. Today, we are asking for the community's help in getting through this surge by wearing your mask and getting vaccinated. This will slow the rate of hospitalizations and give our healthcare providers the relief they need. Thank you to our hospital colleagues for helping us this morning. We're so happy to have Integris Health, SSM Health St. Anthony, and Mercy Hospital here with us today. To start off this morning, Dr. Dale Bratzler, Enterprise Chief Quality Officer for OU Health, will give us an overview of where we are at as a state. So good morning. It's nice to see everybody here, and I really want to uh, thank our colleagues from SSM, Mercy, and Integris for being here with us today. You know, many of you know I've been tracking this particular pandemic since the outset. We first started meeting in January of 2020. It seems like it's been such a long time, and it seems sad that we're still here today having another press conference. So let me hit just a few key points about where we're at in the pandemic right now, and then talk about a few key points I wanna make about the pandemic. So as of yesterday, we've had a half million, more than a half million cases of COVID-19 in Oklahoma. I don't know that any of us ever thought we'd get to 500,000 cases of COVID-19. Um, and most of the state is still in that CDC category of substantial or high community transmission. Sadly, 8,900 Oklahomans have died of COVID-19, and uh, you know that's the that's the actual population of many small communities in Oklahoma. So it's really sad. Uh, the daily average of new cases in Oklahoma now is up to 2,213. That's about the same level of new cases we were at on November 13th of last year, and we just started schools within the past week. Uh, as of yesterday's report, there were 1,392 patients hospitalized in Oklahoma with COVID-19, and 51 of those admissions uh, were pediatric hospitalizations. Now, I just want to highlight something I noticed in the data. So I mentioned that we're at 2,200 new cases per day of COVID-19 in Oklahoma. At the peak of the pandemic, on January 13th, Oklahoma was seeing 4,200 new cases per day. So right now, we're at about 53% of the peak that we saw in January. But hospitalizations are different. We saw at the peak just under 2,000 hospitalizations in Oklahoma for COVID-19. And right now, we're just under 1,400 people in the hospital with COVID-19, which puts us at 70% of the peak. So the key message here is that a larger proportion of people who are being diagnosed now with COVID-19 are ending up in the hospital. We're seeing a larger proportion of cases being uh, admitted to the hospital. So why are we here today? How did we get here? Delta variant. It's a new virus. The virus we dealt with last year is mutated. Uh, we saw Delta vi virus, uh, the Delta variant, devastate the country of India. Remember all the pictures coming out of India, the hospitalizations, the deaths, the funerals, the burnings. And then it moved around the world and it's into Oklahoma. It's highly contagious, at least twice as contagious as the original variant. It spreads very easily from person to person. It carries, when, when you're infected with Delta variant, you carry more than a thousand fold more virus in your airways than you did with last year's Alpha variant. So you're highly infectious. You spread the virus quite easily. It spreads easily to the unvaccinated. And because Oklahoma only has less than 50% of our population that's fully vaccinated, guess what? It's spreading through Oklahoma fairly rapidly. We also know the Delta variant, though, can infect people who are fully vaccinated. Uh, and those people can spread the virus. And it's one of our big concerns right now about schools reopening that even for those kids and, and faculty and others that are vaccinated, they can potentially get infected, though they usually don't get nearly as sick. And finally, 
we know Delta variants infecting our kids, uh, particularly those that are not vaccinated. Only one in five children between the ages of 12 and 17 are fully vaccinated. And even when I look at the college age group, uh, only about a third have had at least one dose of the vaccine. So we have lots of young, vulnerable people coming together in classrooms across the state. One point I want to make is that you have to think that any person you encounter could be infected. There is no way externally to know. A person who's infected with Delta variant may be asymptomatic or have minimal symptoms and could infect you. So why did we get here? Well, we let our guard down. Cases fell in Oklahoma. We were down to 99 cases a day in early June, just 99 a day in the whole state. We opened up. We relaxed all of our mask mandates in communities around the state. Vaccination rates slowed down because people didn't see it as a priority anymore. And it gets hot in Oklahoma. So people move indoors and they do things crowded indoors in events where Delta variant loves to spread. There is some good news about being fully vaccinated. Uh, the good news is that breakthrough infections, while they do occur, uh, they, those people are often um, uh, minimally symptomatic. They don't end up in the hospital. The majority in Oklahoma, as of last week's weekly epidemiologic report, 93% of the hospitalizations in Oklahoma for COVID-19 are in unvaccinated individuals, and around 6% are people who've been at least partially vaccinated. So the pandemic has had profound impact on the health system in Oklahoma. Our hospitals are full, our emergency departments are overwhelmed, and people are being put into uncomfortable positions. It's now common for our hospitals, particularly in smaller communities, to struggle to find a place to send a patient who's really sick. And I'm hearing multiple reports of hospitals having to trans transfer Oklahomans out of state to find a bed. Our emergency rooms are backed up. If you go into our emergency room, you will find that we have quite a number of patients who are holding, waiting for a bed, whether it's COVID or some other illness, because the hospitals and ICUs are filling up, you may end up sitting in the emergency room for hours. Our ambulance crews are struggling because when they bring a patient to the emergency department, it may be a while before the hospital has enough staff to take over the case. And so that ambulance crew is stuck here waiting uh, before they can go and be active in the community. Hospitals are converting non-COVID units back into COVID treatment units. Uh, so I think it's very, very important that we think about these items. Remember that this particular virus is different, spreads rapidly, and it affects young people and results in people being hospitalized. At this point, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Jennifer to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Brasler. We have a little bit of misting rain this morning, but I think we'll just continue. Hopefully the weather will hold out for us. Our next presenter is Dr. Bahar Malakuti, a neurohospitalist and medical director for stroke at Mercy Hospital, Oklahoma City. Good morning. Thank you, Jennifer. If you're young and healthy and you don't have COVID-19, you may think this surge in cases doesn't impact you. I'm here to tell you the current level of community spread impacts every Oklahoman. You might also be wondering what a neurologist is doing here today. This most recent surge in COVID has had a dramatic impact on nearly every healthcare service our hospitals provide. If you get in a car accident, have a heart attack, need an emergency surgery, or yes, even if you have a stroke, there's a chance you might not be able to get the time sensitive care you need. These are all medical emergencies where every minute is crucial. And when our hospitals are filled to capacity, we're just not able to provide the timely care that we normally offer. Mercy has been an advanced comprehensive stroke center certified by the Joint Commission for nearly a decade. That means we have a highly specialized and well experienced team that provides advanced neurological care 24 seven for the sickest stroke patients. We are well known in the state for providing the highest level of care and giving stroke patients the life-saving treatment they need. We're also a tertiary care center, meaning we routinely accept stroke patients needing to be transferred from smaller hospitals across the state to Mercy. We started to see a change in the number of patients needing care at Mercy the second week of July. Our overall patient census started to climb and so did our requests for transfers 
in patients. Today, when other hospitals call Mercy looking for a bed for a patient, more often than not, we have to tell them we can't take the patient. Since July 17th, exactly one month ago, the number of daily transfer requests has doubled from around 30 requests a day to about 60. Mercy has been able to accept an average of 36% of those patients needing a bed. I cannot stress enough, this is not normal. Our normal average acceptance rate is 90%. When we have open beds, we are able to accept nearly every patient that needs to be transferred to our hospital. And this is currently a physical bed issue at Mercy, not a staffed bed issue. We are routinely running out of physical beds to care for all patients, both COVID and non-COVID, who need our help. The minute a bed opens, a patient is waiting in our ER to fill that bed, or it's already been promised to a patient waiting in another hospital to be transferred. And I know this is the case at other hospitals in the state as well. Mercy is a large health system with hospitals and clinics across a four state region. We have hospitals and communities all across the state. Patients at our rural hospitals from Watonga to Tishomingo can't even get into our Oklahoma City Hospital. The providers in these rural communities are calling around to every hospital in the state and ultimately sending our patients, our Oklahoma neighbors, to Kansas, Texas, and Colorado when they are able to op find an open bed there. Additionally, the wait to get an ambulance is long because they too are overwhelmed with patients. Even if an ambulance is able to pick up a patient, EMS is often scrambling to find an ER where they're not filled to capacity and can actually see the patient. If a patient is lucky, a family member may be able to drive them to our facility where they will have to again wait to be treated because we just don't have a bed. A patient having a stroke may be able to get in the door at the ER and get the emergency treatment that they need, but we aren't able to get them to our neurology floor or to our dedicated neuro ICU because those beds are filled, often with COVID patients. We simply cannot provide the same level of care for our patients and their outcomes are suffering. This results in real life, long-term consequences for those patients, for their families, and for our community at large. Some of these patients may die or they may have uh, permanent disabilities for the rest of their lives. The reality is that hospitals have limited resources. Staffing, beds, and supplies are all limited. When we have the kind of increase in COVID patients that we've seen here in Oklahoma over the last month, all our resources are stretched beyond our limits. Our staff is burned out and wondering how we'll survive yet another surge. I could use an umbrella. <laughs> Thanks. The pages are just kidding. Thank you so much. Under normal circumstances, if Mercy happened to be full, another one of the hospitals in our community could have beds available and they could take patients. But every one of our hospitals is full. This problem is currently unmanageable. When I think back to March 2020, when all of this first started to hit our state, I'm filled with a sense of dread. I remember looking around at my community and the global community at large, realizing no one truly understood what was happening. At that time, we didn't know how to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. We didn't know how long it would last. I remember when they first announced shutdowns, it was only supposed to be for a few weeks. Here we are in August 2021, still in the thick of it, and it didn't have to be this way. We can't continue to think of this as a political left versus right issue. It is not. This thinking does not solve the problem. Instead, it's resulted in a sense of complacency in our communities while more and more people die. From minor inconveniences to unimaginable grief, this virus has impacted the life of every Oklahoman. As a state, we're better than this. Let's live up to the Oklahoma standard and do what it takes to protect one another and end this. We're talking about lives lost, husbands and wives dying, mothers and fathers succumbing to this virus, grandparents, children, it is now affecting children at higher numbers than ever before. Patients wake up with a cough on Monday and by Friday, we're having to tell their families there's nothing else we can do and that it's time to let them go. I'm not just a physician, I'm also a parent. Not only am I fearful for my child's personal risk of contracting the virus, I'm also concerned for his future because this is just not the world I imagined for my little guy. And I know every parent shares the same concerns. We are tired of living through this nightmare that has been going on for almost two years. We're tired of masks and isolation and quarantine and constantly questioning if we're making the right decision in weighing our physical health with our mental health and our need to connect with our loved ones. 
We can't plan our lives because on any given day, we have no idea what comes next. This is a crisis, but we have a solution, vaccines. COVID-19 vaccines are proven to work. They are safe and they significantly decrease the risk of contracting the virus. Even if you are one of the rare patients who develops a breakthrough infection, that vaccine will protect you by decreasing your risk of developing severe illness and hospitalization, which will help us create more space in our hospitals. We are begging you, please get vaccinated and continue to wear your masks until we can get to the other side of this. Thank you for that umbrella. Okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Malakuti. So we have a little bit more missed than anticipated, and I think collectively we are thinking maybe we should move under the awning if our media friends feel that that would be a good idea to transition or if we think the umbrellas will suffice. Yes. Stay? Okay. Everybody's got an umbrella, so we're okay with that? Okay, excellent. It's just an Oklahoma Tuesday. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Kersey Winfrey, Regional Vice President of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer for SSM Health St. Anthony. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to represent SSM Health St. Anthony. Our facilities are throughout the state, and we're experiencing the alarming influx of COVID cases. This has been felt throughout the region, but also within our state and our country. Thank you. Including by our colleagues. We are truly all in this together. With this in mind, I've been hearing people say something in the community that I think it's important that we reconceptualize. If you're like me, you might have passively said something like, during the pandemic or during the height of COVID, as if these things were in the past. Well, I wish we were talking in the past tense. Make no mistake, the pandemic rages on, and as case numbers multiply exponentially, the height of the pandemic is likely still yet to come. This is a dire situation, and the rapid increase in patients due to COVID-19 is stressing resources for healthcare across the state. This doesn't just have ramifications for COVID patients, but rather finite staffing and other finite resources mean the care experience of the non-COVID patients are also being impacted significantly. When we say we have no available staffed ICU beds, this means that there could be a significant disruption of care for your dad when he has a stroke, for your wife when she suffers a heart attack, or your child when she is in an accident. When we say we have 27 holds in our emergency rooms, for example, this means we have such an influx of patients flooding our emergency rooms that more than two dozen Oklahomans have been assessed to need a higher level of care and should be admitted to an inpatient hospital bed, but there isn't a staff bed for them. This is on top of many more patients needing outpatient emergency care that are further experiencing long wait times and delays. Things have changed from the first wave of the pandemic that we saw in 2020 and early 2021. The most important change is that we do not have the staffing levels available to care for patients that we had a year ago. This is hard work with a large number of patients needing an unprecedented amount of care. COVID-19 puts our caregivers at risk, not only at work, but also out in the community. Sustained risk, fatigue, and trauma have contributed to an existing medical staffing crisis statewide. The second difference is that unlike this time last year, we have a safe, effective tool to stop all this with the COVID-19 vaccine. If enough Oklahomans will unite together as we have for crises in the past and get fully vaccinated, we can finally return to normal. But we all must act fast. The time to get vaccinated is now. Please don't wait until it's too late. To help illustrate how serious the situation is, we are joined by one of our frontline caregivers, Nurse Reagan Wickwire. Thank you, Dr. Winfrey. 
I proudly care for patients at SSM Health St. Anthony Hospital in Midtown, Oklahoma City. I have been a critical care nurse for seven years and I have worked on our hospital's dedicated COVID ICU since the beginning of the pandemic. A couple of weeks back, we heard the words that we had been dreading. After a brief stretch of declined COVID cases that allowed us to close our dedicated COVID unit, they were being reopened due to an alarming increase of cases. I can't tell you how debilitating that news has been. While not surprising, it was confirmation of my fellow Saints in Action's fears that Oklahomans have not been taking the simple steps of wearing masks and getting a free, safe vaccine, and family and neighbors are paying for those decisions with their lives. Not only are patients flooding into area hospitals at a rate higher than this point last year, but the patients are sicker. In my firsthand experience, they are taking fewer days to need critical care and fewer days to reach the need for bypass machines or ventilators, and they are much younger. We are seeing critical COVID patients in their 20s, 30s, and 40s this time around with a lot of life left to live. They are scared. When they reach our unit, they very much believe the virus is real and they trust their medical professions to use whatever tools we have to do whatever we can to get them better. Our nursing unit is stretched thin. Critical COVID patients take a disproportionately higher amount of resources to care for them than any other high CU patients, both from medical supply to staffing. Still, no matter how many codes may be called simultaneously, our team has committed that no one dies alone on our watch. I can't tell you how many patients I've sat next to, stroke their faces and let them know that they are loved and appreciated. Help us make their stories heard. Please fight with us instead of fighting against us. If you've gotten vaccinated, thank you. If you haven't already, we plead with you to do so. We don't want you your last words with your mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, or children to be over a FaceTime call. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Winfrey, and thank you, Regan. I know as a nurse and all of our allied health professionals, we thank you. Nurses and allied health professionals have been at the front line of this with our physicians, and your story is really important. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Julie Watson, Chief Medical Officer for Integris Health. Thank you for being here today. I am Dr. Julie Watson, the Chief Medical Officer for Integris Health. I know people are tired. I know people are frustrated. I know people want this pandemic to be over. I want this pandemic to be over for my children, family, friends, and the hundreds of patients we care for every day. I want life to return to normal. And life will return to normal when we all lean in and do what it takes to beat this virus. As you've heard this morning, COVID-19 is not over yet. It is picking up steam and claiming more lives, younger lives, young mothers and fathers who didn't think they would get that sick, who were healthy before, who might have heard false information about the vaccine that could have saved their lives. I am here today we are all here today as doctors and clinicians who truly care about you to tell you the best solution we have right now is the vaccine. And yes, even though some vaccinated people are testing positive for COVID, the risk is 600 times less likely that they will need the hospital to get better compared to those who are unvaccinated. In fact, more than 90% of all patients who come to us hoping that we can save them, help them breathe again, stop their kidneys from failing from COVID, haven't taken the vaccine. 93% of Oklahomans who have been hospitalized in the last month with COVID have not had the vaccine. These patients believe in us when they are sick, but seemingly haven't trusted us when we've shared with them how to stay well. It is heartbreaking and exhausting. Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, all of these vaccines are safe. Over 350 million doses have been given in the United States and more than 4 billion across the world have received COVID-19 vaccines since they were authorized for emergency use. 
these vaccines have undergone and will continue to undergo the most intensive safety monitoring in United States history. Yes, COVID-19 vaccines were developed rapidly, but they are based on 30 years of preparation. This family of viruses have been around for a very long time, and scientists have been studying them and trying to develop vaccines against them for decades, long before this one was identified. No trial phases were skipped. The speed came from having years of preparation. I want to specifically speak to young women this morning. I trained to take care of preterm, uh, premature babies, babies whose mothers went into preterm labor. My career has been devoted to helping families deal with complicated pregnancies and deliveries. Maternal and child health is my passion. Many women are scared, women who are pregnant or who want to become pregnant. As an exhausted mother of two, I would never stand here and recommend a vaccine that had any evidence of affecting your unborn children or your ability to have them. These vaccines are safe and frankly protect pregnant women who are all at high risk for severe illness with COVID. Our bodies change in ways when we are pregnant that makes us more vulnerable to this deadly virus. We know now from, the, from tracking the data since 2020, unvaccinated pregnant women who get COVID are more likely to require ICU care to need a ventilator to breathe and are at increased risk of dying from COVID. And we know now from following more than 114,000 women who were pregnant and got the vaccine, there are no increased risks of stillbirth, birth defects, or loss of pregnancy. These vaccines are safe for you. To be honest, I wish that most vaccines were mRNA vaccines it is some of the cleanest technology that I have seen as a physician and a scientist. I took the vaccine as soon as I could, and I vaccinated my family as quickly as possible. Oklahoma, we really need to stop debating this vaccine and start fighting the virus and its variants. The virus is what is undermining our way of life, robbing mothers and fathers of health and of a future with their children taking years away from those who deserve to live their lives to the fullest. The science around the vaccine is clear and is our best hope now. Please get vaccinated. Don't put yourself, your family, your children, your neighbors at risk. Please don't wait until you are lying in a hospital bed. Vaccines don't work at that point. Please get your vaccine so that we have beds to care for patients with cancer or diabetes or heart disease. Get it now, get it today. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. Um, I particularly appreciate uh, Dr. Watson talking about young women because I hear so many conspiracies, falsehoods, and other things that are propagated on social media for young women. Please listen to somebody that takes care of those patients and make sure that we get vaccinated. I want to wrap up with just a couple of real quick comments. Um, I, I've told you before, my father was infantry in World War II, uh, about as patriotic as you can possibly get. Um, and, and if you ever saw, read Tom Brokaw's book on the greatest generation, it described my father. That's the way he was. And I remember, I've, I've told this story before, but I remember standing in line holding his hand as an elementary student uh, to chew up a sugar cube with polio vaccine. And my father would have never questioned the science or the government or anybody else that was promoting the polio vaccine. And we've seen what the polio vaccine has done in our community. It's prevented the disease. We rarely, um, in fact, I don't know of any cases in the United States of polio in many, many years. We crushed the disease by crushing this sugar cube. That's the way my father, it, it was, for him, it was not only, it was a civic responsibility. It was to protect me, but with these vaccines has been highlighted multiple times, getting the vaccine is your civic responsibility to protect the people around you because if you're not spreading the virus, other people don't get infected. It's important for you with your children. This is a virus. It's not a political issue. It doesn't 
you know, follow state lines, political divisions, or anything else. It's just a virus, and it's mutated. And it may mutate more if we don't get it stopped. Hospitals and our healthcare providers are doing everything they possibly can to take care of our patients. But Dr. Watson made the point that there are so many people who get sick with COVID, end up in the hospital and say, either I wish I'd taken the vaccine or can you give it to me now? It's too late. By getting vaccinated today, you can be have full protection. You know, it takes about five weeks to get full protection if you take one of the Pfizer vaccines. It's not too late. You can help us get this outbreak under control. I appreciate all of you being here today. I appreciate all of my colleagues for the very, very important messages. And I want to highlight one thing again that um, Kersey and Dr. Watson uh, made the point about. Kudos to our nurses and our allied professionals. They are the real heroes here. We couldn't do any of this without our nursing staff across the entire state. They don't get enough recognition. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Brassler, and thank you to all of our speakers. We appreciate you being here today. Our speakers are available for additional questions if you would like to interview them one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to have that available kind of over here off to the side. If we could have our media uh, team across our various health system organizations maybe raise their hand. Um, we'll just come forward here uh, and we'll be available for additional questions. So thank you for coming today.